humorous for me, but it confirms what some people say about um, Gibson factories. How can that be intentional? Glenn here, Monster Guitars. You may have seen this guitar before. Without going into every relevant detail, since the last time you saw this guitar, by the way, you'll notice the headstock is no longer attached to it, there was an incident with which I was not directly involved. Again, okay, without going into too many details, there had been a repair job on this guitar, such that a previous break where the neck meets the headstock was repaired. Where that repair job was done, did not break this time. This is a new break. And I've seen this with a number of Les Paul type guitars where there have been multiple repairs done on the headstock. It'll be fixed once and then it will break again. Not necessarily on the original break, but it'll just break again because that's what these guitars sometimes do. I'm not going to blame the, the guitar design entirely in this instance because I know how it was done, more or less. But let's let the past be in the past. <laughs> you can see I'm really not wanting to go into the details. It wasn't my fault, I'll tell you that much. And every other party that is involved has been, has been looked after. <laughs> right? No one is, is missing out on anything because of this damage. Everyone has been duly compensated for it. But there is this broken guitar and I'm not inclined to repair this headstock now. Um, it's a new break straight through, which makes a glue job difficult. Uh, with some other repair work having already been done and now it's broken again, I'm not inclined to try to repair it again. I have something else more adventurous in mind. The original owner doesn't mind what I'm about to do. They, as I, did I mention? I forget. They've been looked after. But I'm going to do something a little bit crazy. Something that is uneconomical. Um, very few people, I think, would recommend doing this just because they'd say, well, you won't get value for money doing it. But it's my time and I can do whatever I want. I'm going to replace the neck because I've never removed the neck <clears throat> from a glued in neck guitar before. I'm using a sharp craft knife to cut through the finish where the binding meets the body. Because I want to, I haven't done this before, so I might not successfully do this, but I want to keep the fretboard. I don't think I'm going to keep the neck. There would be a fair bit of work involved. You never know. But anyway, I do want to keep the fretboard. And as I remove it, I want it to separate nicely from what's under it, namely the neck or the body or that other piece of binding there. Um, and it's all coated in polyurethane, which is what Epiphone guitars use. Um, I think it's polyurethane. I'm pretty sure. If not, it's polyester, but same principle applies. I want it to come away nicely. So I, I'm cutting, not, you know, it doesn't have to be deep, just enough to go through the finish. Because otherwise what might happen is I might lift the fretboard successfully, but it might pull away a, a chunk of finish or or something might happen that I can't predict, and I don't like that. So that will do. Now, I've just done this around the fretboard where it is attached to the body. Whether I keep the neck or not, I'm going to have to refinish the neck. So I won't, because this is, you know, it's a bit fiddly to have to do this. So what I'll actually do is sand the binding, because I'm going to have to refinish the binding, whatever I do. Now, I want to get a fretboard off. It's my first time trying to do this, but... Um, other people make it look easy, <laughs> which is a common trap. Uh, let's just see how I get on, shall we? I want it to get hot enough to soften the glue somewhat, but not so hot that I start melting, binding and whatnot. I guess I'm not really 
directly hitting the fret board, I'm hitting the frets, which in turn heats the board. I'm beginning to make slow progress and I'm told to expect slow progress. Don't want to force anything but I'll just see if I can tap this a little bit further in. I'm making a lot of progress there. But on the whole, <laughs> I'm in maybe a couple of centimeters. So this is going to take a while. Um, come back in a moment, I will have made some more progress. to be as careful as I might under other circumstances because I'm not concerned if I damage the wood of the neck somewhat because I really don't think I'm going to keep the neck. Just make sure you can see what I'm doing. Yes, pretty good. Because I think we're about to come off. Oh, we split right down into the into the neck, which is okay, but it's not what I wanted to do just then. We're off, and that's good. Um, no parts, well, no significant parts that I can see of the fretboard have chipped off and are left sitting on the on the neck. It's all the other way around. Bits of the neck sitting on here, which is, as I said, completely fine. <laughs> I can see something a little bit humorous here. Well, <laughs> humorous for me, but it confirms what some people say about um, Gibson factories. How can that be intentional? It looks like an afterthought, that it's a mistake. I'll show you. Because I was applying some pressure and bending the fretboard as I was removing it, uh, until I need to use it, I've just got it clamped down flat there to make sure it stays nice and flat. Um, I didn't rush in and show you this straight away. <laughs> I had to catch my... You know, pick myself up off the floor, catch my breath and so on. Now, I know what a Gibson neck is supposed to look like, or an Epiphone neck with a tenon. So the neck reaches the body at full width and then it gets slightly narrower into what's called the tenon, which then glues into the pocket. And of course the neck sits over the tenon, the neck is the, f uh, sorry, the fretboard sits over the tenon. The fretboard is full width, but the tenon is narrower than the fretboard. Or sometimes, although I haven't really seen this in, in in Epiphone Les Pauls or Gibson Les Pauls, sometimes the glued in neck doesn't have a tenon. You just, you know, the neck is full width all the way and you just glue it in and, and whatever. You know, either of those methods is completely fine, but that is not. This is what came out of the Epiphone factory in China. Or, do they have more than one? I'm not sure, but it did come out of an Epiphone factory in China in 2007. And, you know, there's a stereotype about things made in China, which is not really true because there's some good stuff made in China. That's not one of them. You know, that's not a tenon. It's not a full width neck either. It's just a, it looks like a broken neck that's been, you know, patched up by having someone jam that piece of wood in there. I mean, there's obviously a big gap between the two of them. That's terrible. And that creates issues when replacing the neck either. Obviously, they're not anticipating that you will replace the neck, but, but I want to. So how do I, you know, because that's not 
that gap there is not where the edge of a tenon would normally be. I'm going to have to, if I go for the tenon anyway, I'm going to have to fill this pocket, or at least fill parts of it, and then route a new neck pocket there, which is doable, but you shouldn't have to do that. Uh, or, or just, you know, make a neck with without a tenon where, where you just glue the whole width of the neck into the body. But that's appalling. Absolutely atrocious. I sent Epiphone on Facebook because you can't send them pictures via their contact form at their website. But I went and sent them on Facebook images of this. I sent them photos and just said, look, man, this is this is not cool. You know, I would never want to send something like that out of a factory knowing that it's going to be sold to customers. That neck should have been a reject. Okay, rant over. Now I will have to decide on what I'm going to do.